Hi, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. We're going to kick off the next hour of sessions here, focused on the theme of pre-launch best practices. And I'm going to go ahead and get us started. So my name is Emily Putzi, and I'm a partner development manager here at Google Play, who specializes in helping developers have more successful game launches. So as you can imagine, I'm pretty excited to be here today with my colleague, Jonathan, who will be coming out to join us in a couple of minutes to talk to you about some trends and tools surrounding new game launches. But first, before we dive into some trends, let's first set the stage. And let's talk a little bit about what's changed in the mobile games industry in recent years and what's that, what that has meant for new launches. So first and foremost, times have changed. And they've changed very quickly. A few years ago, the games industry was really still in its nascency and taking off in terms of profitability. And during those times, games could be made and launched relatively quickly. You could make a game, put it in the market, see if it made any money, and decide if you wanted to invest further. Today, however, the market looks very different. The store is evolving, users are evolving, and the ecosystem is evolving. And that means that launching a new game in today's market looks very different as well. So today, launching a new game is an increasingly risky and expensive proposition. Let's talk about why. So first, competition is higher. Launching in today's more mature and crowded ecosystem can be extremely challenging. With over a million games on the Play Store alone, discovery is hard, and consumers have more choices than ever. Development costs today are also higher. So today, consumer expectations of mobile products are extremely high, and they churn extremely fast when they're not satisfied because there are so many alternatives available in the market. This means that what we're seeing is a lot less MVP or minimally viable product game launches, and a lot more upfront investment in fully formed product launches, so games with social features, long-tail content pipelines, events plans, you name it. Finally, no surprise to anyone, marketing costs are also higher. UA costs continue to rise, and across the board, what we're seeing is less launches and less risk-taking. What's interesting, though, is that despite all of these changes in the market in recent years, for the games that they do choose to launch, most developers today continue to launch games in largely the same way as they did three or four years ago. So here's what we typically tend to see. This is something I like to call the traditional playbook. Concept design and prototype. So look at the market, see what's hot, go off and develop. A tech launch, most likely in the Philippines. A retention beta, probably in the Nordics. Followed by a monetization beta in either Australia or Canada just before full launch. Now, while the countries that I just mentioned might differ here or there, in general, the traditional playbook involves launching a new game in no more than five to seven markets. It means often testing it in production. And that means the deployment is often limited to only higher end device types due to concerns around stability and ratings. Now, if this process sounds familiar, that's OK. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It, there's still a lot of evidence that this process is working well for many. But we at Google Play believe that even for the most sophisticated developers who have this playbook down to a T, that over-reliance on process in a rapidly changing environment can be pretty dangerous because it can lead to a false sense of security. And instead, we believe that developers who are more focused on process as a means to an end, whereby they're thinking more about what they're trying to achieve instead of how exactly they achieve it, are generally more adaptable and ultimately more successful than teams who stay static on this front. So with that said, I'd like to take the next few minutes to share some high-level trends on how game developers today are changing their launch playbooks um, and their development playbooks. First, because of the costs associated with launching, many developers are raising or implementing a more rigorous approach uh, to evaluating their new games and they're raising the bar that's required for full launch. So for instance, a few years ago, let's say a new game might have only had to secure one or two internal evaluations before they secured the right to launch. Now, developers are taking much more of a guilty until proven innocent approach to green lighting games for full launch, and instead requiring continuous evaluation at multiple stages of development, creating more opportunities for feedback and failure, and being more open-minded about pulling the plug on games that simply aren't up to snuff at any stage of the development cycle. So for instance, in the past year, I've worked with game teams that have pulled the plug on games six months or even 12 months into development, or in the late stages of monetization testing, simply because they weren't confident about a game's metrics. 
Now, obviously, this is really hard to do, but these developers would rather pull the plug on a mediocre game than absorb the cost of launching and maintaining that game and instead just focus on fewer, better launches. Another thing that we're seeing today is that developers are trying to identify bad ideas much earlier. So as a result, they're doing two things differently. First, they're testing their new games externally in the market a lot earlier. And second, they're actually changing their technical approach to testing as well. So moving away from only testing production versions of their games to testing beta versions first. Now, technically, both of these approaches allow developers to collect the market feedback that they need to identify bad ideas. But beta testing actually has a lot of advantages to offer developers throughout the development and testing cycle. So instead of me telling you about some of these advantages, let's instead take a minute to watch a video about how a top game developer, Big Fish Games, is using open beta to change the way they develop and launch new games for the better. Big Fish started 15 years ago as a casual game studio. Over the years, we became a powerhouse in developing mobile games uh, for multiple platforms. We've been making games for Android since its inception. It's been great to see how their focus on developer tools and also their global reach has helped us make games better for a much wider audience. One of the great things now is we're able to use tools like open beta to really get early access and information to allow us to actually do more of a user-centered design-focused development. Historically, we've put games into pre-launch that we were already very comfortable with, and we just waited to sort of validate that we had what we thought we had. Now that we're using open beta, we're really willing to put a game out there to the world much earlier in its process. Cooking Craze is a time management game in which you play from the perspective of a chef. Big Fish published Cooking Craze, working with a partner named Elephant who developed it. This is their first free-to-play time management game, and it's super fun. They really knocked it out of the park. When comparing our previous game launch uh, to our more recent one, Cooking Craze, where we used open beta, we saw a dramatic reduction in crash rate, about 21% decrease. We also uh, got a much higher volume of feedback as well, about 10x. The other thing that we noticed based on the larger sample size was with Cooking Craze, we had no surprise one and two star reviews, whereas our past game release, we had a few that were uncharacterized. One of the benefits of being an open beta is you can still be released globally. This allows our marketing teams to optimize their processes, their paid acquisition partners and campaigns that they weren't able to do in a geolog soft launch. Before using open beta, we would pre-release our games into a small number of soft launch countries, and we would use them to see all the metrics that we're looking for. With open beta, we're going worldwide right off the bat, and we're able to gather data from a much wider range of players that is much more representative of what we'll see when we go to our official launch. With open beta, we have said no restrictions, go out, go live, see what happens, and we're able to react if there's a problem instead of assuming that there would be a problem. We're looking at the core game KPIs. We're looking at the team that's delivering the game and their ability to scale. We're looking at a lot of the metrics that are in Android Vitals. When we're in pre-launch, we start by looking at retention numbers. Are people coming back on the second day? Are they coming back on the third day? We're typically looking at D1, D7, D30 retention. Then we start looking at the monetization metrics. But once we're comfortable with those metrics, then we know that it's time to start moving toward our official launch. We were able to increase our retention numbers fairly significantly. We went about nine percentage points up on D1 retention, about eight percentage points up on D7, and about five percentage points up on D30. One of the great things about open beta is that we're able to gather feedback from the beta players without having public facing reviews and ratings. So we're able to fail harder without having sort of negative reviews that stick on our permanent record for the life cycle of the game. My recommendation for all developers out there is to take a close look at the tools in the Play Console. We use a lot of them and we benefit from them tremendously. Just in the last year, we've changed the way we've developed and released our games substantially based on open beta alone. Okay. So another trend that we're seeing today is that developers are increasingly using long-term metrics as predictors of future success. More specifically, long-term engagement metrics like LTV and long-term retention. 
And what this means is that as a result, not only are developers testing their new games earlier, as we just saw in the Big Fish Games video, but developers are also testing their new games for much longer than they have in years past. And the reason for this is that because they believe that in order to understand true user value, that they need to understand the long-term engagement and retention patterns in their games. Now, it's important for me to clarify here that um, when I say developers are testing longer, that I don't necessarily mean that all developers are out there running six-month betas, although many do if they can. But what I do mean, and that's really important, is that um, you know, develop more and more developers today are looking beyond just D7 and D14 metrics. And they're testing beyond D30 metrics at the very least in order to get a much truer sense of the future business success of their new titles and to make decisions around launching accordingly. Finally, developers today are proactively changing their pre-launch playbooks to maximize retention in their new games at launch. And to do this, they're doing a few big things differently. And I'm just going to go through them quickly. First, they're optimizing new game performance across more devices prior to launch. This is not only key for minimizing early player churn, but also to releasing to the masses with greater confidence. Second, Developers are also launching with enough content to sustain their players until their first update, at least. And they're doing this by monitoring content consumption during beta and planning for full launch accordingly. Developers are also building social features, or at least the foundation for social features, into their games earlier and earlier than they have before. And the reason for this is that they want to leverage the bonds that social features create between players to drive strong retention in their new games right out of the gate. And finally, the developers are also testing their live ops plans in full, end to end, prior to launch. So they're doing things like running demand side events and supply side sales, so that they can really truly understand what KPIs their live ops move and where they still need to optimize before they fully launch. So now that we've covered a bit about how developers are evolving their playbooks, I'd like to introduce my colleague Jonathan Chung up on stage. He's a software engineer on the go-to-market tools team for the Play Developer Console. And he's going to talk a little bit about how Play is building tools that can help you launch more successfully in today's market. Thanks, Emily. As mentioned, releasing new games today is increasingly difficult. And Play is committed to building tools to help developers with their launches. While this is a high-level overview of many of the tools available today, I'd like to take some time to focus specifically on some tools that we feel will help you evolve your playbook by allowing you to test differently, test faster, and more importantly, de-risk your launches. In 2015, we introduced the alpha and beta test tracks which allows developers to distribute the APKs earlier than ever before. Today, I'm pleased to announce that we are launching internal test tracks. Internal test tracks allows developers to publish and distribute the APKs in minutes as opposed to hours to up to 100 test users, enabling teams to do rapid iterative testing where they are launching brand new games or new features for their existing games. We believe at Google Play that this is a truly powerful tool, both pre and post launch. Next, choosing where to distribute your game to is a crucial part of your go to market strategy. With country targeting, we are now giving developers more control than ever before in terms of how you want to distribute your games to different regions. This feature allows you to distribute your production tracks to different countries than your test tracks. Now, why is this something that you would want to do? As discussed before, many developers like to get early feedback uh, before development, before launch of the game. And they like to do this using tools such as closed beta or open beta with a cat. But maybe closer to launch, you want to run a production soft launch well, now, with country targeting, you can run your beta tests in as many countries as you want prior to launch to gather some valuable feedback. And once you have proven out your early game concept and fixed technical issues, you can then proceed to production soft launch in selected regions while keeping your beta alive in other regions. This means you can keep gathering valuable feedback while confirming key KPIs 
and building up a ratings pad ahead of full launch. Finally, when you're ready, you can launch fully with greater confidence and less surprises. Now that we've spent some time talking about distribution and testing, let's talk about quality and performance. As Emily mentioned, strong game stability and performance are key for number one, preventing early player churn, and number two, minimizing bad reviews for new games. Interesting fact, 50% of one-star reviews complain about app stability and bugs on the Play Store. Android Vitals provides an overview of the stability of your game, alongside other key metrics such as battery life and performance. It will also report crash rates and ANRs across a wide range of devices and provide stack traces in order to help you debug faster. Not only are Android Vitals key to helping developers address quality issues before launch, they are now also a key signal for Google Play in a number of user-facing areas. Our search and discovery algorithms favor apps and games with strong vitals. And vitals are now an important part when your app or game is being considered for promotional opportunities, such as the new and updated collections, the Google Play Awards, Editor's Choice Collection, and the newly launched Android Excellence Program. Long story short, Play is prioritizing vitals, so make sure you check it out. Pre-launch reports can also help developers iron out quality and performance issues with their game prior to launch. Whenever an alpha or beta APK is uploaded, a non-deterministic bot will crawl your game running on a real physical device in one of our test labs and report on a various range of issues. Game developers have found a lot of value in the pre-launch report. 90% of developers choose not to launch their game if the pre-launch report finds issues. And today, we're excited to announce that pre-launch report demo loops are on the way. So how does this work? Record and upload a game demo loop in OpenGL and receive a pre-launch report on crash and performance metrics, such as frames per second. These allow you to discover rendering issues even faster and launch with more confidence. To wrap up, here are a handful of takeaways from today's session. Remember to try beta tests, not only to gather early feedback about your game, but also to test broader and bolder. Optimize new games for long-term metrics before launching. And remember to check out all of Play Console's tools that can help you with your next launch, including new tools such as internal test tracks and pre-launch demo loops. Next, we're going to hear from Toby about how to develop games for a more inclusive audience. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Tobias, and I'm a Google Play BD manager based in Berlin. Today, I will talk to you about growing your business on Android by building for more inclusive audiences. At Google, we are committed to building for everyone, and we want to help you in doing the same. And for better understanding on how we and you can target every potential gamer out there, we have been conducting research on underrepresented groups in gaming, starting with women in gaming. Today, I will share our lessons learned with you and some recommendations on how you can make most out of this opportunity for your business on Android. But let me first start by introducing Francis to you. Um, Frances has been playing games for a long time. She got introduced to games by her mother and her grandmother. And like many people in her generation, she really got hooked on mobile games when she got her first smartphone in high school. Today, she is playing a lot on mobile, and she loves to dive into the world of gaming. She likes to choose a female character if there is one available. Um, and she is an active member in the New York gaming community today, and she's organizing um, meetups where people get educated about games. But there are way more women than just Frances playing mobile games. In fact, together with uh, Nuzu, we've done research and found that 49% of mobile gamers are women. So that's one half of the total population playing mobile games. And even more importantly for everyone here in the room, 
What we found as well is that 64% of women prefer mobile over other platforms. Now, that's a pretty, pretty strong fact for mobile game developers. And thus, this is a critical key audience, which should be at the front of cent and center of your thinking when you develop new games or you're operating your, on your existing games. But how does this critical audience perceive mobile games? Of course, there's a reason why we have been doing research with Newsroom. What we found is that women feel less as gamers than men. So, um, they talk less about mobile games uh, amongst their peers. They also self-identify less as gamers. And last but not least, they feel more regret when paying for games. So this is not ideal, and probably um, they do not feel as catered as much by the overall mobile gaming ecosystem. So we've asked ourselves, of course, why is that? And to better understand this, well, we took a look at our very own Google Play Store because it's not only about the supply of mobile games, it's also about the demand of mobile games. And there's a strong demand uh, for women to play on mobile. But when we look at the top 100 crossing games on Google Play, we found that male characters are featured 44% more often on the Google Play Store. Well, now, whilst we recommend you to use the icon which works best for your game and your audience, we think that there is an opportunity left on the table. And, of course, icons are the entry point for every game experience out there, so I think we should be aware that this has a significant impact when you are targeting players for your game. So let's put all these information into some more context. We know that uh, 49% of all mobile gamers are women, um, but they do not feel entirely catered by the ecosystem. What we know as well is, so one, the mobile market continues to grow. We have been hearing this earlier, but also, as Emily mentioned before, competition is increasing. So that's why we think at Google Play, why don't we think more about broadening the audience for the games um, developers are publishing, and by this, you can possibly expand your current success with your game by appealing to more audiences. And in the next three slides, I will give you some ideas on how you might be able to achieve that. So number one, this is easier said than done, but we really encourage you to try developing for all audiences. And if I say develop for all audiences, I mean every underrepresented groups in gaming, so gamers coming from all ethnicities, beliefs, and orientations. So ask yourself, how diverse is your audience actually? And could the user experience be different for certain players? And also, do you actually research a bit who could be playing your game when you're developing a new game? Because I know that as a mobile games industry, we're super passionate about games, but sometimes we just make the games we love, but we do not think maybe so much about who will actually play them. So maybe that's the thing to consider. And also, these thoughts are not only true from a product perspective, but also from a marketing point of view. Because if your marketing has, again, um, primarily only um, male characters featured or your targeting is super narrow, again, you might be leaving out the opportunity um, to appeal to everyone out there. So that's one thing. And we think that being inclusive is important and it's about a holistic approach which covers all your activities around your game, whether they're pre-launch or post-launch. This takes me to the second recommendation we have. One thing to consider is to test inclusive imagery with store listing experiments. So let's take a step back and think of your game putting into soft launch. And when your game is in soft launch, you might be figuring out which icon do you want to use, how should your store listing look like. And at Google Play, probably you know this, we have this called, called store listing experiments. With store, mixed exper with store listing experiments, you can basically test which icons, uh, screenshots, and videos resonate best with the audience. So whilst user data will decide which icon works best, why not be inclusive when testing it? Because you decide which icons are getting tested, right? Another thing to consider is if you're introducing new content to, to your existing games with live ops, you can consider maybe adding female characters and see if they are resonating with the audience or not. Just give it a try. At least you would have one more um, gamer in there, and that would be Francis from the very beginning of this presentation. And last but not least, listen and talk to your community. 
find and figure out if really every potential gamer out there um, thinks that they have a good experience when playing and testing your game. Last but not least, one thing, if we as a mobile gaming community want to appeal to every potential gamer out there, we need to think of the developing development teams who are creating the games. So as we know from research, only 28% of people in the gaming industry are not men, meaning women or transgender. And if we now remember ourselves again that 49% of mobile gamers are women, well, I think there is a gap. And at Google Play, we believe that only with a diverse team, you can capture the whole market opportunity. You can only be able to scale your game to everyone out there if you have everyone represented in your development team. Now, I know this is not always that easy, but I think this is a fact we should all recognize and we should think about. At Google Play, we are also trying to do our fair share in this. So we partner with the industry to support women developers. As an example, you can see here on the screenshot, um, on International Women's Day, we promoted games developed by women on the Google Play Store. And obviously, I would love to be here next year again and tell you that we are promoting more games developed by women ever before. I would like to conclude by calling out Google Play's diversity and inclusion initiatives. So first of all, most of the research you have been seeing earlier today is based on Change the Game, which is our um, program to empower women who play and develop games. If you are interested in more information, please check out g.co slash change the game. Secondly, another program we are running is Infinite Deviation. Together with Ideas United, we are tackling issues um, in representation in computer science. So again, this goes back to my previous slides of growing diverse teams, and this is something we are doing as well. And last but not least, on International Women's Day, we did not only promote, promoted games developed by women, but we also showcased a video which showed four founders from around the world who found success in developing and creating games. Watch this space as we will continue our research on other underrepresented groups in the space of gaming, and also to showcase the opportunity which lies in building diverse teams, products, and games. Google Play as a platform is committed to making mobile gaming truly for everyone by celebrating and empowering developers of diverse backgrounds. As a mobile game developer, you have a major impact on how future mobile games will look like. And we hope that you can join us in making the mobile gaming world more inclusive, because mobile games are for everyone. Thank you very much. Next is Canon and Tom, who will talk to you about expanding your game to emerging markets. Thanks, Toby. Hi, I'm Kanan, and I'm part of the Google Play team in India. I work with game developers in India and abroad with a deep focus on emerging markets. With the continued success of smartphones and the rise in internet users, we are seeing tremendous growth in the number of online gamers around the world. Be it a game of word with friends with your cousins in Vietnam or New York, or a game of Ludo King with your friends in India. The gaming ecosystem is booming and bringing people together. But not all gamers enjoy the luxury of high-end devices and high-speed internet. Two billion new internet users came online in the last 15 years, many from countries like India, Indonesia, Brazil, and Nigeria. Emerging markets are at the forefront of smartphone growth and contribute roughly to about 80% of overall growth globally. But these internet users are typically on sub-$150 device with about one GB or one gigabyte RAM. But perhaps you're thinking, I don't need to care about that. I'm concentrated on mature markets like the US. Well, actually, our research showed that US is the second largest market for low-end devices after India, followed by Russia at number three. So mature markets, too, can have a high degree of concentration of low-end devices. The first thing you should understand about emerging markets is that data is like currency. Because when compared to the average wage in these markets, data is super expensive. Let me explain. 
In India, uh, sorry, in the US, one gigabyte of data typically costs about $10, which on average is the wage for about 23 minutes of work. In Indonesia, one gigabyte of data costs only about $2.80, but it takes 316 minutes to earn. Another interesting fact is that while in India, there is one Wi-Fi hotspot for every 3,900 users, in the global average is actually one Wi-Fi hotspot for 150 users. Imagine the network congestion. In these markets, data is primarily prepaid. In India specifically, it's 95% prepaid. This means people buy fixed amounts of data up front, calculating the exact megabyte of data they can spend in a day, in a week, and in a month. As a result, the data use is extremely budgeted. Even with the rise of fast-speed internet, it is estimated even by 2020, over a billion people will still be on 2G networks. But large games don't only cost internet, but also precious space on a one gigabyte device. So it's really important for you to ration every megabyte that you add onto your game, because that one MB might make the difference between an install or an uninstall in your user's device. We at Google want to help enhance the experience for users on low-end devices where they don't have to compromise on quality no matter what their device and network. We no longer want them to feel disappointed with entry-level devices where things just about work. Entry-level devices are a critical lifeline for these users. It's often the only device they have to access the internet and play online games. As we think about democratizing the internet and gaming for users around the world, we want you to ask yourself three questions. Is your game playable, affordable, and engaging? Playable in this context would mean asking yourself if the game performs well in low, intermittent, and even offline connections. Does it support older and low-end devices? Does it keep data costs and battery consumption low throughout the life cycle of your game? Over the past few months, we have invested a lot in trying to understand how to approach these challenges. We're excited to share a framework with you, where, which we use within the company to think about these problems. The framework breaks down how we can make games smaller, faster, and more, more engaging. And most importantly, help you connect with the next billion online users with ease. We've been working closely with game developers to understand how they have been tackling these problems. And today, I would like to share the story of Appon, a game developer in a town called Pune in India, and how they grew the game business by degrowing the game size. Can we have the video, please? Appon is based out of Pune, and we started in 2012. We make games which are easy to explain, optimized for the emerging markets. With such a tremendous acceptance of this smartphone, we have to focus on this uh, markets to maximize our revenues. They hold a great deal of business opportunities for us. So Kitchen Story is a simulation casual game and resource skill management game. So you have to cook different dishes and compete with different world class chef. When the Kitchen Story was at the conception level itself, we, we had kept in mind that Whatever we make, we make it under 20 MB. In India, basically, there are plenty of challenges that we face. One of them is the device compatibility. Second is the data cost. Third is the low performing devices and the language support. So one must make sure that, that the game is built for all the kind of devices and the performance should be same on all the devices, whether it's a high-end device or a low-end device. We learned from our past mistakes that, you know, uh, bringing a game heavier is going to be disastrous for these countries. So we were actually motivated to make a, a game which is a very lighter and a faster. Working with Google, we found out the best possible ways to keep the game size smallest. The first one would be to use uh, notophones instead of using custom phones as it uh, reduces the size of the applications and it's very easy to tr translate your games in other languages. Second of all, native shapes are useful uh, for animations, UI and effects. So if we use native shapes, that helps to reduce the game size drastically. And to make sure that while reducing the game size, we do not compromise on UI and UX. 
I would say use color tables. The image is like matrix of the colors, where you can take the color tables and the indexes separately. Then you just change the color table and you have hold together different image. We made the game to work in the offline mode because in India, not everyone has the internet connectivity all the time. We also shifted our lot of the game data or game assets to on the cloud. Up till now, we've got almost 6 million downloads and over 100,000 reviews with a rating of 4.4. The initial retentions are very high because the game is very easy to learn. So the, the day one retentions are up to 60%. We always uh, focused on making a lighter, faster game with having a great user experience. Now all these techniques which we have been using so far and now it has become the part of our DNA and we do follow these techniques in our newer games. Well, it looks like time management games are hit in several markets. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Tom Greenaway, and I'm a developer advocate based out of Google Sydney. As you just heard, Appon have found success by exploring the opportunities in the emerging markets. And recently, Carter and I have been working with game developers in emerging markets like India to identify ways they can optimize their games for lower end devices. So today, I'd like to share with you a few pieces of advice on these topic areas. Let's start with the APK size. How can you reduce the size of your game for the emerging markets? Well, games will typically have some combination of game code, libraries, and content assets like graphics and audio. One way to reduce your file size is, of course, to tailor your assets for different device tiers. For example, a lower-end device might have a smaller resolution screen and therefore might not need higher resolution graphics. Or the device might not have the latest compression algorithms such as ASTC. So using the multiple APK feature in Google Play, you can actually create variations of your APK that are targeted towards tiers of devices, including the new Android Go devices. Next is the topic of game performance. If your game doesn't perform well, then logically users will not be enticed to continue playing or spending money. So here are a few things you can keep in mind. If you're struggling to, uh, to hit 60 frames per second on a particular device, you could try locking the frames per second to 30 instead for consistency. Also, GPU overdraw is a major contributor to mobile performance bottlenecks. So try limiting the amount of texture blending you're forcing the device to handle. For example, if you have parallax effects in your game, you could try simplifying or combining those layers. And if your game uses complex shaders or other intensive visual effects, you could try optimizing them further or disabling them for particular devices. Now, as Kanan mentioned, in the emerging markets, the, ban the, cost of, uh, the cost of data is really high. In fact, it's not actually guaranteed. So ideally, you should design your games with offline modes to be available for players or to design with the expectation of failure at least. For example, a developer from Australia, not Doppler, released a game called Crash of Cars, pictured here on the screen. And in the game, it supports real-time multiplayer. But they implemented a clever fallback mechanism if their users lose internet connectivity. If a player disconnects, their car is seamlessly replaced with a bot that takes control, and players never realize that there was a disruption to their game at all. Furthermore, the Android emulator's performance has improved considerably over the years, if you use x86 emulation. And through the emulator, you can simulate low signal strength connections or specific, specific cellular connection types like edge, GSM, and so on. So this is a great way to test the durability of your network design. Lastly, there are actually a lot of great tools available for game developers on Android nowadays, such as ProGuard, which can help you remove unused Java classes, resources, fields, and methods from your APK. And Gapid, shown here on the screen, is really great for viewing texture atlases and finding GPU bottlenecks. It works on any device with any GPU manufacturer and any version of OpenGL or Vulkan. Meanwhile, SysTrace and SimplePerf are just great for CPU profiling. And Bloaty APK Analyzer and Classy Shark can help you analyze the bloat in your APKs. For example, there are developers who have used Bloaty to discover that they could save space in their APK by stripping all the log statements in their code. Now I want to leave you with one last thought. I personally believe that the core of all successful games is gameplay. 
However, great gameplay can be impacted negatively if a game isn't optimized for the device it's running on. And so it's up to you as developers not, uh, to not only make great gameplay, but to support that gameplay with the techniques I've highlighted today. And so I urge you, revisit the recording of this talk and look up the tools and techniques I've mentioned so that your games can perform well on as many devices as possible. Thank you. I hope we've convinced you of the potential of the emerging markets for games. And you can find me on Twitter at TCMG. Next, I'd like to introduce Stuart Miles, who will be talking about other ways to drive engagement and game quality with Firebase. Hey, Tom. Thanks, Laura. Hello. Um, as Tom mentioned, I'm Stuart Miles, um, and I work um, with the Firebase team. And I'm, I'm going to be talking about improving user engagement and game quality with Firebase with Nima Atbari. So, to get started, um, we're, we're currently at over a million developers uh, using Firebase. They're building apps um, and games. This is incredible momentum since we unveiled the Firebase platform back at Google I.O. in 2016. Um, game developers have been joining in that party, and it's been really great. We're really happy with that. And so thank you to everyone here who has been part of that, part of um, taking that journey with us. We're, we're really, really happy. So um, what is Firebase? I mean, if you're not familiar with it, it's a mobile development platform from Google. It brings together a lot of our different products um, to work together. Um, we provide a single SDK that um, give you the resources to develop great experiences and grow and re-engage your audience. Um, where applicable, uh, we have Firebase products work together so to provide an intuitive and powerful developer experience. Um, I'll give you an overview of some of the key features and how you can, you, you can use those to uh, grow your audience. So first of all, I'll get started on some of the platforms. Um, we support iOS and Android and the web. Um, we have SDKs, native SDKs for those platforms for game developers as well. My team, we maintain uh, C++ and Unity SDKs. Um, today, we're happy to announce we've actually added support for um, development and testing on desktop for a subset of our features. This includes authentication, the real-time database, um, storage, and our remote configuration tool, which I'll cover in a bit. Okay, so uh, before you increase your audience with some, with some magic, uh, you really need to understand um, what, what players are doing within your game. So if you're selling a premium game, you know, it's likely that you want to understand whether or not players are making it through your entire game, consuming all of the content, coming back and, you know, enjoying it in some way, shape or form. Otherwise, they're not going to buy your next game. You're not going to make any money. Um, if you're selling a freemium game, um, it's likely you want to, you know, track how many ads they're watching, uh, make sure that they're coming back every day, making sure that they're buying those gem or coin packs, things like that. So um, with Google Analytics for Firebase, you can integrate um, our SDK um, and you can start measuring all of this data immediately and it's entirely free. So what we provide out of the box, we provide um, a dashboard that you can start using. Um, we, we also provide the ability to export data into your own um, analytics systems. Um, we, as soon as you integrate the SDK with one line of code, we start collecting events, like for example, the first time your game is opened by a user, the engagement time within the game, uh, player retention, uh, in-app purchases where it's possible, and also user demographics with very minimal effort. Um, you can also log your own custom events um, and pipe that all through um, to understand your player behavior. And then in addition to this, late last year, we released a product we like to call Firebase Predictions. It's currently in beta. Um, and this, what this will do is automatically segment your audience into, um, into groups um, using a machine learned model. Uh, these user groups can then be targeted with some other products I'll be covering in a bit, cloud messaging and remote config. Um, and they're updated daily to keep your predictions fresh. So the groups that we, we do out of the box, we do churn, um, which you know, predicts the, the users that will churn out of your game within the next seven days, not churn the group of users who won't leave your game within the next seven days, spend the users who are liable to spend within the next seven days, and not spend the users who are liable to not spend within the next seven days. So using this information, you can start to get a picture of how well your game is doing, um, and also it can start to give you an idea of how you can start targeting experiments um, to retain and increase um, retention with those, with those users. So once you've got an understanding of um, your developer, your um, players, how do you then, um, you know, stop testing out 
um, ideas and seeing if you can improve uh, gameplay experience or user retention. Well, we have a framework called Remote Config. It enables you to do A-B testing. You can store any parameters you want um, to change your game. Um, you can deploy those um, uh, without re-shipping your game. Um, and you can, so you, for example, you could run experiments on uh, you know, in-game um, um, promotion of uh, in-game um, purchase items. So, for example, in this case, we've got uh, two different experiments running. One where you can get um, additional shield strength for your mecha hamster ball for two dollars, or you could get um, an additional twenty hamster bucks for t for just a dollar. And so we could A/B test this, see which one works the best, and then um, flip a switch on the back end, and everything will be used in whatever configuration that we've set. And so out of the box, um, as soon as you start using this product, uh, we provide a console um, for this, so you can use our console. And we also have a uh, REST API that we recently released um, that enables you to integrate this into your own game development tools as well. So as an example, Rockbike Games works with us um, and use Firebase predictions to segment their users into a, in a way that was not possible before. In the past, they just tried to segment users based upon demographic data and then tested um, dig different digital store UI layouts um, based upon these groups, but the tests were really inconclusive. So with predictions, what they did, um, they segmented users into groups based upon their likelihood to spend or not spend. Um, and then Rockbyte used Firebase Remote Config to deploy changes to their digital, digital store, store UI. And what they discovered was that if they put chests in the top of um, their store for the users who are more likely to spend, um, those users were actually more likely to spend more money in their store. So it was a very, very simple um, um, experiment that they run, and that end, ended up um, boosting the monetization flows and revenue by 25%. So just experimenting, trying things out, um, is a really great way to, to um, improve uh, monetization. Um, so that's great if players are staying within your game. If you want, if players, you know, are starting to leave your game and your app has migrated off their home screen, they're not, they're not opening it that often, how do you bring them back? Well, you could use push notifications, right? And we have a product called Google Cloud Messaging that enables you to do that, right? Um, and this, this enables you, you know, you've seen, you've all seen push notifications, you get a message, pops up at the top of the screen, um, and that can potentially re-engage users. Um, so what we do out of the box, we provide a composer for this. Um, so you can have your marketing teams, like non-engineers, um, sit down um, and compose um, campaigns um, and run campaigns through a uh, dashboard. Um, there's also a REST API, so if you have your own live ops tools or marketing tools, you can do integrations into there. Um, you could also uh, potentially automate campaigns from your back end, so if you run events, you could send messages out to users and try and bring them back into your game. Um, after you've sent out messages, obviously you want to see whether or not they're effective, so we also provide measurement out of the box with this. And so this is an excellent example of a case where using different products together within the Firebase suite will um, we'll pull them together. In this particular case, it's using our um, Google Analytics product. So if, if a user comes back into your game, it's liable that you want to drive them to some content within the game. So what you can do with notifications is you could potentially connect um, connect a notification to a link, um, and if if the if the user doesn't have the game installed, you could even have uh, a user share a link with a friend to try and bring that friend into the game. And so, using Firebase dynamic links, you could you can do that, and you can tailor the link behavior based upon the state that the game is um, on the user's device. So if the game isn't installed on a user's device, you could bring them to a web page. If it's installed onto the user's device, you could bring them actually into the game. Um, if it's not installed, they, you could have it so that it installs the game and then brings them into the right point in the game. And there's many different interesting use cases that you can use here. So I'll go for a really simple one. So we built this small demo game called Mecha Hamster. Um, you can design your own maps as a player within the game. And then, you know, in this particular case, I've created a map and I want to share it with my friends. So um, I create my map in this map editor, I press the share button, um, I select some friends to share with, I write a message, run through, I've shared the link, my friend receives an email, um, when they tap on the link, um, it actually goes through and um, will open the game and uh, it, will show, it will show the content for the user um, in that game. All right, that I've shared with one of my friends. If they haven't got the game installed, it will take them through the app install flow, um, and after the app is actually opened, it will just open in the correct point in the app. There's no need to go back, find the link in the email, which you've probably forgotten about after you've installed it, um, to actually continue through to that content. 
So if users are creating this content within the game, um, it's very likely you want a way of um, being able to store that um, content within, within your game in backend. You could write your own custom backend, or you could just, again, use Firebase, right? You could use, um, so if you use our authentication system um, um, to get an identity for the user, um, then you can start associating additional data with the user. So our authentication um, solution enables you to um, associate a single identity, so one identity for your game with different um, login providers. So someone could log in with Twitter, Facebook, Google, or today we just um, we just released support for Google Play games as well. So on Android, you could do seamless sign-in, um, which is you know really low friction sign-in. As soon as the user opens the game, they're automatically signed in. You can take that sign-in and you can associate that with a Firebase authentication identity. Now with the with that identity, you could then store data in our real-time database, um, and this can this this is real time in the sense that it synchronizes data across um, all devices listening to a point in the database within about 100 milliseconds. Um, this could be used to build collaborative editing tools. Like, for example, in our um, Mecha Hamster game, we have like a, a map editor, and you can modify a map, and other users can see changes in real time. Um, or you could build real time, um, you could build um, turn based multiplayer games and things like that as well. Um, if you need to store large amounts of data, so for example, you're pushing new asset packs out, or you're doing things like um, allowing users to upload user-generated content that's large, like for example, if they're creating new art assets within the game, or they're sharing screenshots and things like that. Um, we have a product called Firebase Storage, again, with that authentication um, token that we provide with Firebase authentication. Um, you can upload um, user-specific data. There's also a whole rule system that can be applied, and it's, again, with no server-side programming. You just write a little bit of script, and you can, you can limit the access to um, um, data stored in Firebase Storage to um, a set of users. So this could be used, for, uh, for example, to send out premium content uh, to users who, are who just purchased it for example, or as subscribers. So again, following the theme of not having to bring up your own back end, we also offer integration with um, Google Cloud Functions. Um, this enables you to do things like um, associate, um, take um, an event that happens in your game, run some logic um, that then um, controls whether or not um, an action can occur. So I'll give you an example. So for example, if, um, a develop if in your game, um, a player uh, plays through 10 different levels, and then you want to reward them with something, you could have um, a Firebase function um, um, actually track that user's progress, um, and then once they hit, you know, they've completed five or 10 different levels, you could then send them a reward. And the reward could be a modification, you could, you could surface that for a modification in the database, which then unlocks something in their inventory, or it could be something like um, you send them a push notification to try and get them back into the game. They've played, five, played through five levels, perhaps you send them a push notification that tells them, hey, come back to the game, come and consume more content. Okay. So now uh, Neema's going to come up and talk about testing uh, with Firebase Test Lab. Let's do it. Sorry, man. Thank you. Hi, I'm Neema. I'm from the Firebase Test Lab team, and I want to talk about testing for mobile games. So game developers know that testing is a critical part of releasing a high-quality game. But we realize that testing games on Android can be challenging. The Android ecosystem has done a great job of enabling diverse device diversity. This is why Android devices are expanding so quickly in emerging markets. With all these devices, it's not reasonable for most game developers to go out there and buy them all. And even if you had all those phones, manually testing would take a lot of time and a lot of money. That's where Firebase Test Lab comes in. We've built a lot of labs that host a growing number of 80 unique devices, a mix of physical real devices and virtual ones. We help you run different types of tests across all these devices. And with our command line client, it's easy to integrate FTL with your continuous integration systems. This way, you can be confident in every change you make to your game. I can already hear you saying, but Nima, testing games with Android's provided testing libraries is hard. We've heard you, and we've been working with different gaming partners to create the following testing solutions. If you don't have any tests, no problem. Our robo team has been focused on games testing. And as a first step has made it possible for robo to test games with random actions. Now when robo encounters a non-native UI, like most games are, it will send many touch actions per second, exploring the game while, while, while collecting performance data, 
video, and screenshots. As for any app, you only need to pro provide your game APK. And here you can see Robo playing Zushi. It's playing it pretty well. Last year at I.O., we announced Game Loops, our first testing framework for games. With Game Loops, you can write test scenarios inside your native code. No need to work outside your normal environment or write any Android Java code. You can write custom results that matter to you, and we'll grab them off the phone for you to analyze. This year, we're happy to announce that after working with the Play Prelaunch Report team, in a matter of weeks, the Prelaunch Report will automatically run your Game Loops for free when you launch in the when you launch your app in the alpha and beta channels in the Play Console. To get started, we have a Unity plugin as well as a code lab that walks you through the process of adding Game Loop. NetEase is one of the top gaming companies in China. They have released more than 150 mobile games since 2014 and have run several top PC games in the last 10 years. We reached out to NetEase to learn more about their testing solution. They ensure a high quality of all their games through a dedicated IDE which helps them create and run automated tests. We worked hard with them to publicly launch this framework for all developers to use and to automate tests for the games. So to help me demo this IDE, please welcome Shin, the technical director of NetEase Games, here to help me demo. Great. So, uh, so Shin here has the NetEase IDE, and it's already connected to his device right here. And with this, you can actually interact with the device within the IDE and use this as the main method of creating your test. The IDE allows you to select different parts of the screen and use that with simple actions like touch, swipe, wait, uh, sleeps, and different visual asserts. So now you can create a simple test. And at this point, we have no SDK integrated. And this is all with just the game. We've asserted that our hero, our little fish, is there. And now we can start the game. And if you need to interact with more complex 3D elements, you can add and instrument your game with an optional SDK called Poco. And we've already done this with this game. And so we're able to interact with the joystick. And as you see here, Shin is now selecting our skill. And we'll be moving the joystick around and then that will complete our test. What NetEase does here is that they have the images that we take, and they're able to do image comparisons on the runtime screen and determine if that object exists. And if it does, it'll actually click on it or do the action that's provided. So we'll go ahead and run this test. Great. It's run through, and now it's moving our fish character around, and our test is complete. So NetEase generates a custom report that we can look at. And in this custom report, you can see a couple of cool things. So it shows you what has passed and what has gone wrong. And you can see the target object, which was the target for the action, as well as a runtime screenshot that NetEase takes at each of these action points. So you can ensure that it fails or passes at certain points in your script. Now that we've created a script, we want to run it on a bunch of Android devices. So we can bundle it as an instrumentation APK for Android. And we've already done this, so we don't have to go through this whole process. So with this a instrumentation APK, you can add it to Firebase Test Lab and run it on all of our devices. So here in the console, this is where you would see all of the Firebase products. Maybe we don't have internet, it looks like. OK. Well, we would have to upload the APKs, which we've already done here. And we can skip to device selection. So here we have our library of devices that you can select through. And we have different devices like a Pixel phone, a Samsung phone. And you would go through and select dev which devices you would want to run through. And at the bottom, you can do more advanced configurations, like which orientations 
as well as different locales that can actually happen on the device. We take all this information and we use it to run your test, the test that we just created on all those devices. Do we have internet? <laughs> okay. Let's just... Uh... So we'll just skip straight to the results. I don't think we have the results preloaded, but here you can see that we ran the tests, and the tests have some that passed and some that fail on the specific devices that we ran. And we can dig in deeper. Oh, great, we have internet. Uh, we can dig in deeper, and here we show you the logs to, from the log cat that we pulled off of the Android device, and you can use that to debug if there's any issues. And we also collect performance data at no cost. The video says the whole video of the the test run, and our performance data shows you CPU, memory, and network usage across this run, and soon to be fire, uh, FPS. And this is in time with the video itself. So if we can actually go back to the slides. Thank you, Shin, for helping with the demo. You can. You can get started with this IDE today at airtest.netease.com and use it with Firebase Test Lab. Hopefully testing on games just got a lot easier. Thank you. <laughs>